Thank you all for joining the webinar. So let's jump into it and get going. So here's the framework. Uh, you've seen this enough in the emails that you've gotten from me. We're going to look at sharpening goal clarity. We're going to look at improving time management, supporting remote colleagues, and tackling tough conversations. You asked uh, for some, some specific questions to be addressed when we put this out in a, in a poll. And here are the three questions. These were the top three questions that you were interested in, and we'll address those as well. We lack clarity around our top priorities, so we end up uh, doing a lot of firefighting. Secondly, we're, we seem to be better at meeting uh, commitments we make to customers than we do inside of our organization. And then the third uh, top vote getter was how many chances do I give someone who's not meeting expectations? So we'll cover all of that and hopefully we'll have uh, time toward the end for uh, some of your questions as, as well. All right, so here's what I'd like you to, to do. Um, this is, I'd like you to get centered. This is really going to be uh, uh, primarily focused around individual achievement, although we will be covering some elements of team and enterprise performance, but I'd like you to set aside your phone. I'd like you to mentally set aside your to-do list so that you can get centered for the next 90 minutes or so and bring 100% of your focus to get the value that you are expecting. So this is the book that I wrote five years ago, published by McGraw-Hill, to set and accomplish fulfilling goals, which is what we're talking about today. We must execute at a high level in each of these four topics that we're going to examine. And accountability is a, is a powerful tool that, 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 that really determines whether or not we are effective. And it's also, accountability is also, I have found, one of the most universally misunderstood and misapplied concepts in business. And, and that's one of the reasons that it's so hard for us. It's one of the reasons that, that leaders like you uh, often struggle with accountability. I know that I did when I was a leader, uh, that this, this tension, the, the strength that accountability provides and the struggle to wield accountability's strength effectively is what I examined in this book from an organizational perspective. I've begun a new book on personal accountability and some of what we'll cover today, including some new tools that I'll be sharing on this webinar, will be included in my new book. You're successful. That's why you're on this call. What separates super successful people from all the others is really the mindset that, that is brought to this idea of accountability. And the, the savviest leaders understand that accountability is a choice. So whether or not we're accountable is really based on our choice of what we choose to tolerate, whether it's, it's behavior in ourselves or in others. Accountability is, is not punishment. And, and so it's not something that you do to people, but rather accountability is something that we do for people because we care about them. And so this idea of accountability is not like a light switch that you, you can turn on and off. Accountability is a way, it's a mindset of being all the time. The thing that I have found, the most important thing that I've learned about accountability, whether it's personal accountability, team accountability, or organizational accountability, is that clarity creates confidence. When you are clear about what matters most, you can be confident in the decisions that you make. And I say the, the opposite is also, is also true, that confusion causes chaos. And, and so what I have found is that when, when accountability problems rise up, what, what happens is that somewhere, somehow, in some way, something isn't clear to someone. And so when it comes to accountability, Clarity is the closest thing that I have found to a silver bullet, and this is the back of my business card. This is what I believe. So what I encourage you to do, and you see my website there, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff uh, today. There's a ton of stuff. If you've already familiarized yourself with my website, I encourage you to go there because the tools that I'm going to share today and, and a ton of other tools, uh, articles, blogs, exercises, questions, 
are all there for, uh, for the taking and it's all free. That brings us to our, our first topic here, which is sharpening goal clarity. So what's the difference, do you think, between a New Year's resolution and a habit? Well, I would say that it's about six weeks. And, and so most people, if you even went through the process of making a New Year's resolution, generally people find that those resolutions begin to fade about this time which explains the timing of today's webinar. And so at the risk of, of picking at this, this scab that I'm calling the year 2020, I do think that it's worth a brief look back because how we responded in 2020 provides two clues for setting and getting goals. So if you think about this, like, like you, I bet you, you, you were on planes all the time. I was as well. My last plane trip was March the 12th, 2020. The very next day, you see it here. This was the day of, in, in the U.S., a national, uh, a national emergency. And, and, and what happened is that two seismic shifts occurred side by side, and these shifts began transforming our lives. I'm certain you felt them. Uh, here's what happened. Starting that Friday, fear, uncertainty, and doubt began to grip us, and our initial focus was acute. Care for ourselves and our loved ones, care for our colleagues, care for our customers, care for our business. We took things step by step. And so, if you know anything about Austin, which is my hometown, you might be familiar with this restaurant, El Arroyo. They are known as much for their cleverness as they are for their food and their margaritas. And you should check out their books with, with some of their funniest signs like this one, because during 2020, new words were created like Blur's Day as one day blurred into the next. But one of the, one of the seismic shifts that, that occurred was this idea that we just had to keep going. And in his book, Shoe Dog, some of you may have read this, Phil Knight, Nike's founder, says that this version of persistence, just keep going, is the best business advice he ever received. So what, as he was launching Nike, what, what, what Phil Knight wrote in the book was, just keep going, don't stop, don't even think about stopping until you get there, and don't give too much thought about where there is. Just whatever comes, whatever you do, don't stop, just keep going. And throughout 2020, I watched the leaders that I work with really double down on, on, this, on this principle and, and, and relentlessly worked through day by day and, and getting their business to the next step. And at the end of the year, at the end of 2020 in December, I asked the leaders that I work with to rate the year, give it an A, give it a B, give it a C, give it a D. All of the leaders, every one of them incredibly rated the year as either an A or a B. By, by just keeping going, things got better. Things worked, worked through it. And so this was a, this was a big thing. But what happened was, and here's the, here's the, the other seismic shift. What, what happened was as people were busy getting one foot in front of the other, Many people naturally begin to wonder, wow, is, is, is this really fulfilling for me? Is, is this, they, they, they took a step back and, and, and began to wonder if what they were doing was worth it. And, and so one of the things that, that we're going to look at is, is this nature of the passion that we bring to our goals is going to say a lot about whether or not we are going to accomplish them. In, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, some of you may be aware of this by Viktor Frankl, the, the Holocaust survivor. One of the things that he said is that he found, he's, he, he really had this theory that he, he, he tested on himself in the, in the camps. He said, man can only live by looking to the future. And, and so this is the phenomenon when we take a broader view when we step back from the daily grind and we set our time horizon out beyond the next 12 months to maybe five years to seven years, even 10 years, something magical happens. Our goals expand. 
our goals become loftier. And, and suddenly these larger goals become worthy of our best efforts and our full capacity. Because with a grand goal comes excitement and passion and commitment. And when we are excited and commitment, almost anything is possible. And so if you think about this, this to me is very different from setting annual business goals or New Year's resolutions. This is all about trying to chart your, your destiny. And so one of the things that I'd like you to just think about based on this little bit of, 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 of preliminary uh, material that we've covered, I'd like for you to think about the goal that you're most excited about today. I'd like you to jot that down. What, what is that goal? What, what is a goal that, that you can imagine for yourself that actually gets you excited? And, and then as you're thinking about that, I'd like you to also just jot down, well, what is it about this goal exactly that excites me? The thing about accountability is that it requires a level of, of honesty that, that many of us may find uh, new or, or strange or, or maybe even a little uncomfortable. Uh, Carl Jung was a protege of, of Freud, and this, this quote, I think, is, is, very, is very apt when he says, your visions will become clear only when you can look into your own heart. The person who looks outside dreams, but the person who looks inside awakes. And so if you think about this, and one of the reasons that we designed this, this, this template in this green is, is because it's this idea of, of, of reawakening. Spring, even in Texas, with six inches of snow on the ground, is around the corner. In another couple of weeks, we'll be in shorts. So, so think about what needs to be reawakened for you. And as you do that, I'm going to, I'm going to show you this, this schematic that, that I have, have, have built. And, and you can also find this on, on my website. So if you, if you think about this, this, these building blocks of, of destiny, it really illustrates our path of decision making as we move forward from where we are today based on what we, what we, we value and believe and the skills and the life experiences that we, that we bring to the destiny that we are pursuing. And, and this schematic showcases four concepts that I wanna highlight just very quickly. So first of all, anything that we do needs to be bounded by our values and beliefs. Our values and belief provide the guardrails for us on our journey. Secondly, any plan, whether it's a personal plan that we're developing or if it's a, if it's a company strategic plan, that plan needs to nest inside of our values. We cannot, in good conscience, execute a plan that violates our core values, or at least we shouldn't, if our values are the non-negotiable behaviors that we say we are. And this idea of, of values, we're going, to, we're going to talk about this as it relates to how we have these coaching conversations with underperformers. So that's the, that's the second thing, our plan nests inside of our values. So the third point is when you think about your personal fulfillment and you think about this in terms of business results, those should also nest inside of one another. So the, the results that we produce for our company, whether we are an owner or a, a president or a unit manager, or you know, we've, we've recently joined a company Part of why we've joined this company is that we believe that the things that we are doing are personally fulfilling for us. Because here's the thing, and this is the fourth point. If, if we, we can work at a high level and produce great results, but if we don't love what we're doing, we need to take a long look at why we are doing it because we might conclude that the sacrifices aren't worth it over time. So my father, Years ago, before he he died, I was a I was a pretty new owner at, at this point, and I was already uh, having some second thoughts about ownership. I was certainly having accountability problems, 
And I was having a, a, a beer with my dad and he said, well, look, here's, here's the kind of his secret to life, really. He said, do what you love with people you care about at a, at a place that you, that you care about. My father was really not a great businessman. He was an entertainment editor uh, at the Austin American Statesman, but he could have worked anywhere in the country. He had offers in, in Los Angeles, in, in Chicago, in Houston, in New York. He turned them all down to stay in Austin because he loved what he was, was doing. And so when he said these words to me, I, of course, said, well, then what, what about the money? And his quick comeback was, well, if you take care of the first three things, the money will come. And I, I will tell you that that certainly has been the case for me. I mean, it, it, when, I, when I decided to adopt this advice that I, that I was given, the, the first year or so looked pretty rough. But I can tell you that we all wouldn't be here today if I wasn't doing something that I love. So the idea of this is, is to think about your, your destiny and what I'm calling the seven Fs. So this is a document that I, that I developed probably 15 years ago. This is also available on my website in another form with some instructions around it. And, and the idea is this. I mean, here's the question. You can read it at the top of the page. What, what is a hugely ambitious future that, that you passionately want to achieve for, for either for yourself or your organization that is new, different, and maybe so bold it will stretch you beyond your wildest imaginings. Now, you may say, okay, enough of that, man. We already did that last, last year. I got stretched. I reimagined the business. Uh, one of the one of the greatest overused words of 2020 was the word pivot. So maybe you've already made that pivot. But the question is, are you having fun? Are you feeling fulfilled? And are you living your life fully in all seven areas of your life? And if you are, that's terrific. But if you are not, and if one of the reasons that you've tuned in for this for this webinar is to say, OK, I'm looking for a way to, to, to set a goal that I really believe in, because if you really believe in, then, then you are actually more inclined to accomplish it. So there are three other questions that we need to ask ourselves. These questions are important and we know that they're good. In fact, they're so basic, you may say I've already asked myself these questions. Here, here's the thing though, we, we may not have been fully honest. We may not have taken the necessary time to step back and reflect on what exactly is my answer to each of these three questions. I can tell you that after my father gave me that advice, uh, a year or two later, these are the questions that I asked myself. And I came up with some surprising answers. When I was really honest, I came up with some answers that were different than the things that I was actually doing. So here's the first question. What do I stand for? When, when you figure this out, when you know what your non-negotiables are, here's the thing that I, that I believe to my core. When we know these are my non-negotiables, then what it does is it makes our difficult decisions easier. Because when we know what we stand for and we codify these in our organizations as our values, when we know that, then the answer will be clear. We may not like the answer, but the answer will be clear. The second question that we have to ask ourselves is, well, what are my strengths? And, and Peter Drucker says, most of us don't really know what our strengths are. I've got another document for this on my website that you can look at, and there are some great uh, tools out there, like Predictive Index is, is one of those uh, strength finders. Uh, is, is, is another one, Discovery Insights. All three of those give us each different insights into ourselves. And when we know what our strengths are, then we know who else we need on our team. We know the, the people who need to complement us, and we know the people that we need to have around us who will protect us from our weaknesses and our blind spots. The third question that we have to ask ourselves is what do I want? And that's what we've been spending 10 minutes on already this morning. What do I want? And, and when, when you've got that very clearly, then what that does is that turns that goal into a dream. And if, you're, if your dream 
like, like Jung said, when your dream becomes awakened, then the things that you need to do no longer seem like drudgery. So it's worth asking as you, as you think about where you are and as you think about reflecting on what's exciting in terms of a goal that you want to set for yourself, I think that, it, that it's appropriate to ask, is the path that I am currently on helping me to get what I want or is it holding me back? So that's, that's what we have. We have to be brutally honest with ourselves. And that's what I did. I was running a firm, a consulting firm of 55 marketing consultants, but I was not having fun. And, and I realized that, that I needed to make a, a, a change. And, 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 and I did. And, and that's what I want to invite you to consider. So without realizing it, or, or maybe my father did realize it at the time, what, what he was articulating was what I've come to call a sweet spot, because what he was able to do was to live life on his terms. And what he shared with me is that it was possible for me to live life on my terms by figuring out, okay, my values, what I'm willing to do, the strengths, what I'm best at doing, and the goals, what I want. And when, you, when you're able to figure this out, I really do believe that you're unstoppable. And, and so just to net this first piece out this first component around sharpening goal clarity. Here, here's how I would net this out. Number one, we need to be very precise about what it is that we want when it comes to goal setting. Number two, if you're not excited, then you don't have the right goal. And then number three, pursue your goal relentlessly by taking a series of small, meaningful steps every day. And so one of the things that you should be thinking about right now would be to say, okay, so what would be something that I would have to stop doing in order to make this goal that I wrote down five minutes ago a reality? And another thing that you could think about is like, okay, is there a new habit that I'm going to need to get into in order to make this goal of mine a reality? So take a minute on that, reflect on that, and then we're going to move into the next the next section. I mean, clearly what I am preaching here is this idea of clarity. The clearer we can be about, about what we stand for, what we're good at, and what we want, the more likely we are going to be able to set a goal that is meaningful to us and that we are going, going to be willing to commit the time and energy to make it a reality. Here's, here's the thought. For, for most of us, the, the, the challenge, the, the greater challenge that you see here, it's, it's not about whether or not we're going to achieve our vision. The, the question is, have we developed a vision that's worthy of our best efforts? So are we are we really playing at a high level? Are we are we are we playing big or are we thinking too small? And, and so one of the things that that I that I've been doing over the last really three months that started right before Thanksgiving is redefining for me what success looks like. And the reason I, I share this, if, if it may be, if it may be helpful to you, I was coming off a a, a record year in 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 2019. I I, I I traveled to the UK. I gave over 60 uh, workshops. Uh, I, I helped more than 15 companies with strategic planning sessions. My three peer advisory groups with Vistage were all full. It was just a great year. And then 2020 hit. And all of those conferences where I spoke went away and, and that all went away. And it got me thinking, I wonder if there is a new version of what success needs to look like for me. So maybe you've already been thinking this way. Maybe you have already settled on, on what it is for, for you. And that's cool if you, if you have. But the thing that I want you to be able to do is just to think about, okay, am I excited? Am I truly excited? about the goals that I am setting for myself. Another way to, another way to think about it is, is, is this, when you think about that, that building blocks of destiny and, we, and, you, and you think about the seven Fs, 
it's a, it's an opportunity to to cast your horizon further out and and contemplate i wonder how i will be remembered i wonder how i'll be remembered all right let's look at improving time management because that certainly has to go into any kind of, of personal goal setting or organizational goal setting. So I've got this quote from Samuel Johnson. You may be aware of Samuel Johnson. He wrote the, uh, the Dictionary of the English Language. It took him nine years to write this definitive version. He said, look, people mostly need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. And so really a lot of what we're doing here is common sense, but the reason that I'm sharing it with you is because I don't see it commonly practiced. And so as we think about improving time management, I'm gonna break this down at a couple of levels. We're gonna look at the organization's approach to time management, and we're gonna start there because the organization exerts its force, that's our culture, on your personal time management, and culture always wins. Now, if you're at the top of the food chain and you have a hand in setting culture, then you can certainly guide this and, and have a say in how that impacts your, your own time management. But, but as you move further down in the organization, it becomes harder for you to set your own personal time management principles and keep them because the organization is exerting such a force on, on us. So then we'll also look at, at personal goal setting as, as well. So here's another document that is on my website. It's called a migration chart. Uh, when you go to my website, you'll see in the top right, it'll say resources. There'll be uh, four or five documents that drop down. This is the, uh, the document that is most often downloaded. And the reason that it is, is because it is a great way to stimulate a conversation in your organization about how we set priorities. Now, if you were on a, a, a calendar fiscal year, in other words, your, your calendar year ended uh, December 31, then you probably were already doing this back in September and October. The thing that I wanna point out on, on this is that your, your organization's plan, what you see represented here, and by the way, this is not the full plan, and it's certainly not a budget, but what it does is it, is it, is it allows us to begin to, to shape the, the priorities around how we are going to allocate people, money, and time. And so the, the idea is that, here's my view, you should always build your plan first around your priorities and then allocate time, people, and money and not the other way around. But I see this happening a lot. I see people building a budget and then squeezing their priorities into the budget and that's bass backwards. So I wrote this article for Forbes. This, you can also find this on my website. And it talks about the, the four primary reasons that most companies' strategic plans fail. One of them is because they flip-flop their approach to how they are approaching their, um, their plan and their, their budget. So once you've got your migration chart, what you've really done is you've, you've gotten conversation around these seven areas that you see on the far left-hand side, then you should compare those decisions with your org chart to confirm that this is really going to be how work gets done. So the migration chart that you see here on the left confirms your priorities. Your org, your org chart confirms role clarity and it's where you set expectations. So you, you wanna make sure that these two things match and you wanna make sure that, that you are crisp in these, a lot of people say, well, the boxes are so small. I say, well, that's by design because you wanna get very, very clear. You wanna get very concise, very crisp on how you are going to measure whether or not we accomplished our priorities. And you wanna get equally clear in terms of articulating expectations. So some people call an org chart an accountability chart. And I believe that if you don't get this right, anytime that you don't have that clarity, whether it's the, the priorities on the left-hand side or the roles on the right-hand side, any decision that you're going to make is going to be flawed because it's not going to truly represent what needs to get done and who's gonna do it. So one of the questions that we got from, from the poll, and I'll just answer this now because I think it, this is where it fits, we lack clarity about our top priorities. We rush from fire to fire and so work is delayed or suffers. So what's to be done 
about that. Well, to, to increase, sorry, to decrease <laughs> firefighting, first you've got to determine the extent to which there are patterns to the fire. And I, and I believe a very simple high level way of, of doing this is to gather data with your leadership team. This can either be the executive leaders or it can be a project team or it can be your functional, uh, your functional department or, or unit. So before you call your next meeting, ask your colleagues to name three things, not people, you see it here, that make it difficult for them to be their best. I think that this, this open-ended question is so robust. First of all, you're asking people to identify issues and not get into the blame game. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I really do believe that, that most people want to perform at a high level. So we are giving them credit for that and say, look, I know that you want to, I know that you want to perform at your best, but there's got to be something that's in the way. And I will tell you that this little exercise, probably the, the most recently, uh, uh, in, in, most recently that I've used this, has probably been within the, the last year, where we got a group of leaders together and we said, okay, list those those three things. There were there were five leaders in the room. There could have been a total of fifteen things. There were about ten things. We had conversation around it. We got the ten down to five, and that became the priorities that we needed to address. And so when, when you've got these fires that are always getting fought, you've got to figure out what's causing them and you've got to get them fixed. So what you've got to figure out, and we'll talk about this some more as well, you've got to separate excuses from reasons. Because when you've got reasons, those things are legitimate and need to be addressed. Excuses tend to be a pattern that, that either reflect uh, mistakes or just an unwillingness to get to get something done. So this is a this is a great way to figure out. Okay, what is the source of the fire? How do we how do we uh, solve for it? Who's going to be the champion? Let's set a deadline and let's and let's move on. So when you think about time management at the organizational level, here would be how I would net this out. Number one, get clarity around your priorities with the migration chart, which you can download for free. Take a look at your org chart and ask yourself if that's really how work gets done. Do you really have clarity ar around expectations for everyone in one of the boxes? Secondly, you've got to limit your priorities to, to no more than five. So you either have to say no to certain things, you have to say later to other things, or if something truly does become a priority because you could not have predicted it, then you've got to simply take something off the list and put the new thing on it. There's, there's an old saying that chasing two rabbits, you'll catch none. So, so you've got to get really, really clear on what are the five most important things where we can be our best. And then for fires, you just heard me say it, figure out where the pattern, because typically when you get your leaders together, several people will have the same problems. And that will be your indication that you know that this is something that has impact either across your team or across the enterprise. Assign the champion, set the deadline, and get going. So let's, let's take a look at how we, we manage our, our, our personal time. What does that look like? Again, we've, we've gotten a little bit of a clue on, on this because we've already figured out what our sweet spot is. So now we need to figure out, okay, if this is our sweet spot, we've got all these opportunities. Out of all of these opportunities, which are our priorities? So this is another new tool that I've created. I've actually, I've actually used this concept for over, for over 15 years, but I've just created it and it's on my website. You can go to uh, buston.com backslash resources and it's under personal vision and goal setting. It's called life's priorities. It's, it's pretty straightforward. I've not written any instructions. We just got this uh, document built in the last couple of weeks, but the way it works, is, is not rocket science. You just list all of the things that are opportunities for you down the left-hand column uh, in that, in that perp, under that purple header. And then you, you list your strengths. I think it is, it's a good idea to just, even if it's subjective, to assign some kind of a number on a one to 10 basis on whether or not this opportunity actually plays to a strength or whether it's something that is, you're, you're not so, so good at. I think that you need to rate your passion as it relates to this particular opportunity. 
And then I think that you need to set some kind of a time um, uh, boundary on, on how long it's going to take you to complete or achieve this particular opportunity, whether it's a day, a week, a month, a quarter, whatever the case may be. The next column is money. Is this an opportunity that's gonna cost you money? Is this something that's going to, to make you money? And, and after you have gone through all of that, you're gonna to come to some kind of a, of a conclusion and you're going to be able to rank your priorities. I use this with uh, private coaching clients. And as I said, I, I tested it on myself first uh, about 15 years ago. And I'll tell you the surprising thing that occurred after I had built this document, I brought it home and over dinner one evening, I shared it with uh, my wife and our daughter who was a teenager uh, at, at the time. And, and our daughter, Jordan, took one look at it and she said, you've not, you've not allocated any time for uh, family travel. You, you've not allocated time for holidays, for, for, uh, for vacations. And so I had to go back to the drawing board. And, and the way this works is you've either got to take something off your list or you've got to decide to give up sleep. And, and so I think that this is just a very useful way of getting our, our, our thoughts that can be a bit jumbled onto a single page where we can deal with them. So once you've done that, here's another new document that I've developed in the last week or so. Again, there's nothing extraordinary about, about this except that I just tried to have a little bit of fun with, with it. Uh, I, I call it a, a personal success roadmap. And again, you can download this for free on, on my website. It's so new, I don't have the instructions uh, documented yet, but I'll, I'll walk you through it uh, pretty, pretty quickly. What you are doing is you are envisioning your, your journey as it relates to the goal that you want to, to, to that you've set for yourself. So you've got a, you've got a destination and it's going to help you determine the amount of time and energy you want to invest. It, it want, it'll, it'll help you determine the side trips that you're not interested in, in taking. And, and it may help you determine the help that you need along the way. So I've, I've, I've done this, I've, I've, I've put this together in, in the way we should think about this is in 90 day increments, because it, that, that's, a, that's a very useful time allocation because on the one hand, it's short enough to keep us focused and, and, and not get distracted or disappointed. And on the other hand, it keeps us really in a place where we can say, okay, we can check our progress and make adjustments along the way. So this, this document provides a very quick summary of, first of all, right, right here, our most significant road trip highlights. What's happened in the last 90 days that we consider to be significant? Write those down in that space. Then as you move across that, you say, okay, well, this is where I am today. So how would I, how would I, how would I rate how I'm feeling about where we are today, where I am today in terms of my energy and in terms of the rest and relaxation that I need as I think about where I want to go over the next 90 days, what, what does that look like? And it, and it can actually be longer than that. I mean, this is something that I have, have used for, as I said, for, for years. In, in one instance, probably eight or nine years ago, I got it into my head that I wanted to deliver my accountability workshop in, uh, in the UK. And I didn't really know how I was going to do that, but then I began making a plan on how I would achieve it. And I wrote all that down and I followed it you know, little, little by little. And I was, I was really fortunate to have some great sponsors. And I know that we've got some folks from out of the country with us today. And I don't know if, if uh, Ian Lindsay from Wales is on the call or Bob Batty from England is on the call. They were my champions the first time that I went over uh, to the UK. I was over there in, in 2019. Laura Gordon uh, from Scotland was one of my sponsors and Kate Marshall from Ireland uh, was another sponsor. But the idea around this is to, is to get really, really clear and then set down the things that need to happen in order to achieve the goal that you've set for yourself. The mileage piece on this, rate your trip. So how's your gas in your tank? I mean, do you have a full tank? Are you feeling good about things? Are, are you, are you, are you, are you feeling good about your expense of, of energy and time? That's what you're really rating. 
And then if you, and as you move down here for, for trip metrics and milestones, these are your personal KPIs to say, okay, am I on schedule or am I falling behind? And then this last section over, over here that you see on the right, key issues and decisions discuss with my accountability partner. I've been either as a member or as a facilitator, I've been a member of a peer group for more than 25 years. And I highly recommend it because I think we all need someone to lean on. We all need someone to, that, that can encourage us or to, or to point out things that, that we are, are missing. And, and the reason that I think that this is important is because when I present a topic for discussion to my peers, and then I declare the action, number one, I have put my stake in the ground that makes me accountable. By, by declaring my goal to someone besides myself, I've now, I've now made that public. And, and I think that when we do that, that creates an added level of commitment to the passion that we are already bringing to the goals that we've set for ourselves. The other thing that happens is that we get this feedback and usually what happens, and, and to this day, I'm, I'm still doing this with other, with other Vistage chairs, they'll say, okay, that's cool that you wanna do this, let's see where you are in 30 days. And this is what accountability sounds like. I, I, I really, this was, a, this was an epiphany for me as I started digging in to this whole notion of accountability 10 years ago. I thought I was pretty good at it, but I realized that I was approaching it from the wrong end because accountability for so many of us, and it certainly felt like this for me, it felt more like scolding. It was a conversation that I didn't want to have and the person on the receiving end didn't want to be there either. And, and what I found instead is that when we approach accountability like coaching, it's so much more productive for, for each of us. And, and so it's a, it's a concept that I think really is one of the reasons that accountability gets a bad rap because we tend to look at it from the opposite end. So if you think about personal time management, this is the worst way to end your work day. You're, the worst way to end your work day is just by leaving. Is 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 in 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 the in the age of Zoom, which obviously we are on right right now. All of these things can can blend in to one another. We need to plan. We need to set boundaries. We need to take a step back and and plan the work that we that we intend to accomplish and not be buffeted, as uh, as one of my groups says, like a dead leaf going down a stream. Right, even a dead leaf floats. We need to take command. Of, of, of how we want our, our, our schedule to be organized. And so the best way to end the work day is to, is to think about, okay, where am I today? How did I get things done? And what do I need to get done tomorrow? So as we drill into the nuts and bolts of time management, here are some things that we should ask ourselves. We should ask whether or not the task we are being asked to do is within my role or not. And if it is, then we should set a deadline for completing it. And we'll talk about the priorities in just a second. But if it's not something that, that, we, that we should be doing, right? If you remember the org chart, if this is something that is outside our role, we, we need to figure out what's going on with that. We need to figure out whether it's worthy of our accepting it. We need to figure out whether or not we're doing the work of someone else or whether it's possible that we can delegate the work because it actually should be done by someone else. Now, I realize that if you're on this webinar, you may say, well, what do I do when it's my boss? I think it still merits the conversation. I think that I, the, the way that I would come at this and the way that I did when I was coming up through the ranks was to say, okay, I've got all these things. I've only got this much time. Which of these things do you not want me to do? And I think that that can be a legitimate question because when we get spread so thin, we're gonna get burned out and we're not going to be capable of delivering our best work product. So part of what we need to ask ourselves is, is where, does, where does this task rank from an impact point of view? And then we need to determine the extent to which it's urgent. And I get that everything is urgent right now, but, but, it, but at some point we have to say, 
If all we're doing is urgent stuff, then maybe, as Covey said, we're not working on the important stuff, right? It may be one of those fires that we're trying to put out, and we need to figure out how we can prevent the fire from erupting to begin with, and then decide what needs to be done and rank your tasks. This is all about getting clarity. It is all about setting priorities and then executing against that clarity and those priorities. And then lastly, as part of all of this, again, you can see how all of this comes together is to, is to figure out what are the things that I need to get done this month, this week, this day. And, and, and to, to, this, to this day, I am a big believer. I set these for myself. I, set, I tend to set weekly goals because my days get blown up a lot. I set weekly, quarterly, half year, and annual goals for myself. And for the big tasks, I break them into weekly and daily chunks. I would really encourage you, you see this last uh, bullet point here at the bottom of the screen. I would really encourage you to break your time into 15 minute increments. You'd be surprised how you're investing it. So ask yourself this, this was a, a tip that I got from my boss about 25 years ago and I've used it ever, ever since. Ask when am I most productive? For, for me, I'm most productive in the morning. So I schedule my difficult tasks at the peak of my performance, which is in the morning. And I delay secondary tasks for later. So really this idea of, you know, do we, do we, do we chunk it down? Do we do it all at once? What, what does this look like for me? I think we've got to really ask ourselves and we've got to find out when we are most productive. Starting and stopping tasks increases the time spent on a task by at least a third. So it's, it's, it's better to the extent that you can do this, to, to chunk it down, get it done and move it off your plate versus being interrupted three or four times in the course of the day. It'll prolong the task and it'll, it'll take more time away from the things that you need to get done. I would also consider a morning power hour. This is a great way, this is me time, especially in the age of Zoom. We have got to have time for ourselves. Learn to delegate. Uh, this, this is one, this is advice that I gave to uh, one of the CEOs that I was working with uh, recently. A lot of meetings. This person is, is drawn into a lot of meetings. And I said, hey, why don't you look at it this way? Why don't you figure out whether or not you need to be in all of those meetings? And why don't you figure out whether you can come to the beginning of the meeting and, and give the meeting a good start and launch it? Or you can show up at the end and have someone summarize it. Do you really need to be there for the full hour? I don't know. But what Buffett says is successful people know how to say no to almost everything. So this, this quote from Arnold Bennett, I, I love because he says, which of us has not been saying to himself all along, I shall alter that when I have a little more time. And he says, look, we've always had all the time there is. It's up to us to manage our calendar, to know when we're, to know when we're at the peak of our performance and to, and to schedule things accordingly. So from a personal time management, here's how I would net this section out. Review your org chart and make sure that the activities that you're focused on are the right ones. Analyze your time. You're gonna be surprised how you're spending it. And then reserve at least one hour a day for yourself, plus lunch. You're not, you're not effective when you're stressed. All right, let's look at this. I think this is a great segue into uh, supporting remote colleagues. So let's take a look at what that looks like. There are five questions that every employee, no matter where in the world they're working, no matter the size of the organization, no matter the industry, these are five questions every employee wants answered. Why am I here? What do you want me to do? How am I doing? What's in it for me? And where can I go for help? What I would really encourage you to do on, on this is, is, to, is to think about creating this as a simple survey. We're coming up on the one year anniversary, bad as it may be, of COVID, of the, of the pandemic lockdown. I think that it would be a great opportunity to, to just do a, a, a benchmark to make sure that people understand, okay, why are we here? If, if we were not here, who would care? What, what is it about what we do that makes us so special? One of the companies that I, that I work with, they, they did a survey out to their employees, and I love this question that they, add, that, they, that they asked. They said, why do you make the sacrifices you make to work here? 
it can't just be for another buck an hour, can it? There, there has to be other reasons. And when we get that clarity, then that's going to tell us an awful lot about the great things that are going on in our culture. Number two, we've beaten this to death already this morning. It is roll clarity, roll clarity, roll clarity. What do you want me to do? Number three, tell me how I'm doing. If, if, if you are tracking and using that as a stick, then, then we're using it for the wrong reason. I think that tracking is a scoreboard. And I think that our best people want to see how we're doing. Are we ahead or are we behind? Number four, what's in it for me? There's nothing, you know, millennial about this. We all are doing what we're doing for something. And, and it's based on Maslow's hierarchy of, of six primary drivers. I talk about this in my accountability book. Money is one of them, but there are five other reasons that people show up and do what they do. I was on a webinar yesterday with a group of uh, California CEOs, and, and one of the things that we were talking about was the difference between motivation and inspiration. Motivation comes from within. It is not our job as leaders to motivate people. So these six drivers, whether it's money or being in charge or helping other people or, or learning, whatever those, those drivers are, that comes from within. But our job as leaders is to inspire. And so part of our challenge is to create this vision that's big and bold enough for everyone to get excited and to see where they fit in helping us achieve this vision. And then number five, I love this question because I think it says an awful lot about our culture. Where can I go for help? Am, am I able to go to my direct boss or am I gonna go to somebody else? Colin Powell says that, that what happens when, when people stop coming to you as the leader to tell you their problems, it means one of two things and both of them are bad. It means either they believe that you don't care or, it, or they believe that you can't help them. And so we need to be mindful of all of these things. And I would really encourage you to put some version of this out as a, as a survey. If you do it, make sure that you share the results so that you're transparent. Hey, we had a survey, here are the results, highlight the strengths, and then commit to addressing the areas where there are opportunities for improvement. This whole idea of supporting remote colleagues, I believe, is a blend of head and heart. And so on the head side, you see these things. We, we've got to be exceedingly clear about what we are as an organization are trying to accomplish. And we've got to be very clear about the role clarity. What do we expect people to do? One of the things that we, are, we should do is we should engage in cross-functional problem solving. We should have more one-to-ones. This is not necessarily about status reports as much as it's checking on the well-being and the status of the things that are on people's list. We need to set boundaries and protocols. Meetings need to start on time. They need to end on time. We need to allocate time for me time. I'm not talking about PTO time. I'm talking about time during the day when we as leaders have time to recharge our batteries and to think strategically and creatively versus running from fire to fire to fire. We need to be exceedingly clear about clarity around key performance indicators or objectives and key results. Those things will drive our, our accountability and our performance, especially in remote, uh, with, with remote colleagues. And then we should ask people, hey, how can I help you? As a leader, we're in the barrier removal business. What is another barrier that's in your way? This is similar to the exercise that I, that I mentioned about 20 minutes ago. So those are just five things on the head side. What about on the heart side? I think it's very important to celebrate small wins as we, as we move down our road toward these bigger goals. I think that collaboration is hugely important. I think people want to be involved. We need to make the distinction of giving people a vote or a voice, but there is no doubt that people have ideas that they want to share. And when we do that, that, that creates some passion for them. I think that one of the things that caused us to be so untethered during uh, this, this pandemic is that all of the known rituals just went out the window. And so we need to look at those opportunities to bring back rituals so that we can create certainty and we can provide meaning in the workplace. 
I think the other thing that's important, don't look at, at, at when people are getting work done. Find out if they're getting the results or not. That's, that's, what's, that's what should be important. And one of the things that we should remember, we see this in study after study after study. I saw this in December in the Wall Street Journal. The, Gallup's, the, the Gallup study said, even, even today, a manager accounts for 70% of an employee's productivity. Whether or not someone is engaged, whether or not they are productive, 70% of that is because of their manager. So before we blame the person, we need to make sure that the manager is doing all the things that need to be done. Tracking has never mattered more in, in terms of remote colleagues and how we support them. We have got to get clarity around, around our KPIs or OKRs. Here are seven questions to answer. I'm not gonna belabor this. You'll see it on the recording. But, but this whole idea, I will, I will tell you this, I, I do about 50 workshops on accountability all over the world. And in, in, in every single instance, in the, what I'm calling the seven pillars of accountability that I wrote about in my, in my book that, that primarily focuses on organizational accountability, every single time, including last week in Buffalo, New York, this is the lowest scoring pillar out of all seven pillars. Not because people don't track, and, and not because they're not good at, at tracking. The, the problem is that they, they, they track so much stuff that people don't know what's most important. They haven't connected the dots, right? This is question number four. How are our people connecting what they're doing with what we're measuring? I asked this fundamental question just two weeks ago. I'm surprised it hadn't occurred to me before then. I said, why do we track? Why do we track performance? And, and, and so I got, these, I got these comments like, well, you know, it tells us whether we've done it or not, to tell us how much more we've got to do. And I said, yes, that's, that's all correct. But the reason that we track is to help us make decisions. So we need to think about tracking as a decision-making tool, right? Because when we are able to put this information into the hands of our colleagues, then they can become self-tracking and they will see how what they are doing is getting them closer to their goal, whether it's their personal goal or the goal for their business unit or their department. And we can make a story out of what our numbers are telling us. Our numbers tell us a story. The question is what story are our numbers telling us right now? So tracking has never mattered more. So to net this out in terms of supporting remote colleagues, I would, I would really recommend you thinking about some kind of a survey to mark the one-year benchmark of where we are. A lot of people have said recently, I've, I've heard this in the last six weeks, wow, I wish we had had some benchmark to see where we were pre-pandemic. Well, we don't, or maybe you do, but, but now is the time to, to ask those five questions, to discover what your people are thinking, feeling, and, 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 and what is, is what, 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 what passions uh, do, do they have? What questions do they have? Uh, we, we, we covered very briefly this, this blend of head and heart to keep your remote colleagues engaged. And then this idea that tracking does the heavy lifting of accountability. It really is a decision-making tool. Let's look at tackling tough issues. This is the last of four topics. I'm gonna go through this. Well, it looks like we'll have probably 10 to 15 minutes uh, for a little bit of Q&A, if you're interested in that. When, when people are doing work they love at a company they believe in and they trust their boss, th this, is, this is the big thing. Accountability is going to look, sound, and feel a lot more like coaching. And so how we tackle these conversations, it actually, maybe the issues are tough, but the conversation itself doesn't have to be tough. We owe it to, to the people that we are supervising and we, and, and we owe it if, 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 if the issue that you have is with your supervisor or your boss or the founder of the company to, to figure out what's going on to see whether or not we can have a conversation with them to see whether or not they're capable of adjusting their performance. So when I wrote about this in my, in my book, my, my belief is that when you have a high-performing culture, 
there are all of these steps, which I call the seven pillars, character, unity, learning, tracking, urgency, reputation, evolving. There are all of these pillars that need to be in, in place. And what I, what I concluded was having a very, very pointed conversation where it's sort of a line in the sand, that, that conversation is really the exclamation point. It is at the end of this process. There are all of these things that can happen before we have this kind of a conversation. And so part of what we want to make sure of is that we are very clear on, on our values and we can use that as a lens through which we're having this conversation. We want to make sure that we are tracking and we are posting that as a scoreboard to help everyone make decisions about their own performance. So when you have an underperformer and all of these things have, have not borne the fruit that you wish they, they had, the, the values have not have not channeled the performance in a particular way, that the tracking has, has not done what it what it needs to do in terms of having the person see where they where they rank and how their performance is is showing up. Before we have a conversation with an underperformer, we need to ask ourselves six questions. You can actually find this as a as a blog on my on my website. I think I called it eight questions to ask your accountability consultant because you'll see that I've I've put some extra questions into the six, but the very first place to start is to say, okay, what role do I play in the behavior that I'm seeing, right? What, what, what's going on where, where perhaps I have, I have enabled uh, the, the, the behavior that I'm getting. The second question that we need to ask is, I wonder if the other person, this underperformer, I wonder if they actually know how I feel about their behavior. Because if the answer is no, or I'm not sure, we've got to own that as the supervisor. We can't be mad. We cannot be mad at, at them uh, because of how we have, have shown up on this. The third question that we ask is whether or not the person is coachable. Is, is there a hill that we have placed in their way? Do they have the will to get it done? Do they have the skill to get it done? We can observe will, but it is very hard to coach. What we're mainly coaching is skill and what we are correcting are the hills or the barriers that are in the way of the underperformer. The fourth question that we ask is how much of this behavior is costing us? Beware, it's more than time and money. Reputation is a factor here when we don't address it as the underperformer's supervisor. Number five, what's my deadline for seeing positive change? We need to set benchmarks and we need to come up with a non-negotiable deadline for when we expect the problem to be fixed. And then lastly, we've got to have a picture in our head of the ideal outcome. And we can ask, okay, is there a lesser outcome, so better than we're getting now, but less than ideal, that, that would be satisfactory to us? We've got to ask ourselves, ultimately, what do we think is going to happen? And, and then we have to ask ourselves how all these questions affect our coaching and timing decisions. So before we have any conversation with an underperformer, these are the questions that we've got to ask ourselves. Pete Carroll, one of the great football coaches, first at uh, USC uh, and, and now at, at Seattle says, each person holds so much power within themselves. And, 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 as, and as the coach, what we need to do is we need to help them with that little nudge Carol's talking about that little bit of direction, that little bit of support that, that they need that, that will enable them to get their performance back on track. So when we do become the coach, we need to be all of the coach that our colleagues need for us to be. We need to be authentic. People can take honesty when they trust our intentions. So honesty counts. We need to bring our best. We need, to, we need to prepare, we need to get locked in, we need to understand the personality type. Some people want the headline, other people wanna tell a story. We need to understand what's going on there. We need to be exceedingly curious. Listen to, listen to the words that people are using. Listen to the words that they're not using and, and, and figure out what might be missing. We, we've, got, we've got to become genuinely curious about what's going on so that we can dig deep, 
We've got to we've got to get in there. We've got to listen to all those word choices. We've got to watch body language so that we can figure it out and have them come up with the answer that's going to get their performance back on track. And then lastly, we exit and we execute. So when when we're done with the coaching conversation, we get agreement on next steps. We memorialize memorialize the uh, commitments and we set milestones and deadlines. So there is a science and an art to this. So I've given you some techniques, a little bit of process to think about. Here's another way to look at this. I call it the iceberg conversation. And, and so because what we are trying to do is we have got to get below the surface and understand what people are thinking, what they're feeling, and what's driving them to do or not do whatever it is they are doing or not doing that we don't like. So when you when you think about the science of, of tackling this, this conversation, this is the framework. We've got to, as part of our coaching conversation, we've got to identify the real issue here. And I know that several of you on this call are members of, of Vistage groups. Some of you may be Vistage chairs, and you will recognize this for the approach that we typically take in group meetings when we are processing someone's problem or opportunity. We've got to make sure that we are identifying the real issue. We've got to make sure that of all the, all the options available, the best possible solution is determined. We've got to get agreement on the expectations, as I just said. And at the end of the deadlines, we're celebrating or separating. The art of tackling these tough conversations really rests with our choice of questions. So the questions that we choose to bring will say a lot about our genuine interest and our care for, for, the, for the person. But when we've asked all of these questions and the other person comes to the, to the conclusion that this is what needs to be done, we draw the line at the bottom and either say, okay, we're either celebrating or separating. And as I like to say, sometimes we're doing both on the same day because by the time, by the time we have determined that, that a person may not be in the right role, everyone else has already determined that. So let me, let me address this question. This is a second question from the poll. We're going to wrap things up, and then I'll take your questions if, you, if you've got them. So what happens, we were asked, if we're better at meeting commitments that we make to our customers versus to one another? And here's what I would say. Your organization's culture, whether it's one that's built around account accountability or whether it's one that's built on excuses, is going to determine the performance of the vast majority of your employees. Your, your top 10 people are self-starters. Your bottom five to 10 people, you're gonna have to have a systematic way of moving them out of the organization. It's the middle folks in the, in, in the, in the bell curve, the 70 to 75% whose performance rises and falls on their manager and the culture. So the most powerful form of accountability is a high-performing team. When you are on a high-performing team and a person who's on this team is unable to meet their commitment, the other people react and approach the situation with genuine concern. It's not as an adversary. We don't immediately go to DEF CON 1 and say, why aren't you getting this done? It's because we trust and respect you we're interested in you. We got to figure out whether there's a legitimate problem and whether or not we've got to solve that problem that's making it hard for you to meet your commitment. So that's one approach. And that, that looks like a high performing team with a culture built around or on accountability. If you're getting excuses, that's a different story because what, what happens is excuses really indicate a pattern. And, and over time, you're going to have to you're going to have to address that. And it really it really goes to this next question that people wanted to ask about: How many chances do I give someone who's not meeting expectations? Well, your culture says a lot about that, for for one thing, because your culture says how people get hired, how people get fired, how work gets done, how decisions get made. So the the, the way that this works from a coaching standpoint is that it's okay for you to believe in the other person more than they may believe in themselves. That's what makes you the coach. 
but you cannot want the success for the other person more than they want it for themselves. Sometimes you just cannot rejuvenate a person who's not capable of doing the work or who is not fulfilled by the work that they're being asked to do. And so the litmus test for how many chances is really based on your culture. It's, it's based on the, the, what, what this is costing you in, in terms of morale, what other people are seeing, the, the, the basis of the mistakes, the, the time that, that's, that's going into this and the deadline that you have set for them to get their performance back on track. Ultimately, the answer to this question is the time to move someone out of their job is when you don't feel guilty about it. Because when you have done everything possible to help them be successful, you, you cannot take responsibility for something that is responsible where, where they own, where they own the, the responsibility. And so the, 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 the net out of this, the summary of this is that before you, you have that conversation, determine your role in the process, ask those questions, approach the conversation as the coach who wants to help someone, and then lean on the science, the framework that I showed you, and then the, the art. I've got a new ebook that's coming out. This will be free. It'll be posted on my website. Uh, it, it goes into much more of this detail. It's about 5,000 words. Uh, how, do you re, how do you rejuvenate an underperformer? Look for that. You'll see an email uh, on that sometime in the next, um, in the next 30 days, and it'll, it'll be free uh, and available for download on my website. Uh, how, would I net, how would I net out today's conversation? It's not really been a conversation. It's been a monologue. I would say the summary is this, in each case, whether you're sharpening goal clarity, whether you're improving time management, whether you are supporting remote colleagues and whether you're tackling conversations, clarity is the key to all of this. I would be happy to take your questions. We've got about um, 10 or 12 minutes and I'll be happy to take as many questions as we can. Here's, here's one that I got uh, that, that came in from an email uh, yesterday. There are double standards in our organization. Underperformance is addressed with some people and not with others. Uh, what, what do I do about that if I'm not in charge? Well, I think the first question that you've got to ask yourself is you've got to figure out where you draw the line in terms of say, how bad does it have to get before I'm willing to make some kind of a change? And what my belief is around that, especially as I coach key executives, people who do not have the final word in, in their organization, you've really got three options when you, when you see double standards uh, like this. The first option is to exert your influence. You're on this call because you're a leader. You have the opportunity to, uh, to, to step up and to exert your uh, influence on, on the folks that are around you, whether it's your peers or it's a supervisor. Uh, and you can see how, how you know, that's, that's really essentially coaching up. And sometimes we have to do that. Your, your second option is to say, you know what, in the scheme of things, this is not so bad. You know, there are a lot worse things. There are a lot of great things going on in, in my job. I like my role. I like the company. There are a lot of great things that, that I like. What I'm seeing here, it's, it's not a deal killer for me. The third option is to say, yeah, it is, it is a deal killer, a deal killer. And at some point, I'm just going to have to leave because I don't see it getting any better. So if I were to net this out and summarize how you address um, double standards in the organization, uh, I would say, first of all, the first step is to step up. The second step is to say, shut up. I'm okay with the things that are going on. Or your third option is to say, I got to shove off. I've tried everything that I can do. Uh, my, my, my coaching is falling on deaf ears and I'm, I'm, I'm tired. Of, of, of the double standards that exist um, in, in our organization. I got another email. If you are hardwired to be an autocrat, what would you recommend steps to help the leader change in their behavior? Well, I, I think the, the belief that if you, if you think that you've got all of the answers, uh, then that's probably going to be a bit of a problem. I, I think that, uh, I, I believe this, that none of us is as smart as all of us. And I think that we have the opportunity to, 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 to collaborate. I think to, to get that down another level of success when there is a problem, 
and, and we can and we can bring that problem to light, then we can talk about it and we can talk about the extent to which th this problem is costing us time or money or customers or morale. And, and then we have the opportunity to say, is there a way to make it better? And, and so there, there has to be an impact and that impact needs to be seen by the quote unquote autocrat. I got another thing that says, uh, for the team exercise, what are the three things that make it difficult uh, for me to be my best? Uh, I would, and the, the question was, should this be done in a group setting or should this be done as an anonymous survey? And I would say, well, it depends on your culture. The whole idea of doing this is to be able, and one of the things that uh, causes plans to fail is that we are not addressing the meaty issues. So we have got to, over time, develop trust with our teams. And the way we do that is by little by little in talking about these tough things. So the way that you might start would be to say, okay, do it anonymously. And, and so I've done this in, in, in planning sessions where there might be 10 or 12 people around the table. I pass out index cards and say, what's the one thing that we're not talking about that we need to be talking about? I collect the cards and I, and I, put, I put on the pad you know, those, 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 those things. So you can certainly do it that way. And that may be where you have to start. But ultimately, if we are not capable as a management team of, of talking about these differences out in the open, then it's going to be really hard for us to address the things that we need to address to drive the change that we need to, to drive. I mean, there's a reason that Lencioni's five dysfunctions of a team the bottom base starts with trust, because it, if, if we are not if we are not capable of trusting one another, then we're not going to have the kind of healthy conflict that we need. And conflict does not need to be mean spirited. It just means two incompatible ideas. So somebody is seeing one thing over here, seeing something else over there, or someone is saying something over there, but the but the words and actions don't line up. Those are conflicts. And as leaders, here's another con word. We need to confront that situation. So confront, again, does not have to be mean-spirited. A, a, a confrontation is two Latin words, con meaning with and front, bringing something to a head. So it's our job as leaders to confront this. And part of how we are confronting is our search for the truth. And what happens is that people have two versions of the truth. And we need to get all of those versions out on the table so that we can talk ab about that. Uh, there's, a, there's a question, how do you get people to, to answer the, the question? I'm not sure what, what question you're, you're referring to. It, it may be any kind of a, a tough question. If you're, if you're talking about the iceberg conversation, I mean, people are only going to trust you to the extent that they believe that your intentions are good. If, if they really see you, if you're the boss, or you're up here, then they have to believe that, that you want the best for them. And, and, and if you are able to demonstrate that, then over time, they will tell you all of the things that, that, that need to get out on the table. And they will also be able to hear the, the, the difficult truths. But one of the things that I've learned as a, as a recovering consultant, where I was paid for the answers, is to now, before I make a statement, I turn every statement into a question. And I'm not trying to be disingenuous. And I should say that if you've already decided to demote someone or to fire someone, don't go through the iceberg conversation. The iceberg conversation is there because you believe that there are redeeming qualities and that for one reason or another, these valuable people have just gotten off track a little bit. And so you're, you're trying to dig in and understand what, what caused them to go off track. And, and you're asking questions so that you can, you can shed new light on things and frame situations or questions in a way that they've not considered it before. So um, there's some, uh, there's some uh, on that. Let's see. Oh, here's another question that I got is an email. My colleagues won't like me if I bring up performance issues, well, again, let tracking do the heavy lifting of that. If you've got tracking and if you've got empirical data and everyone's got this, you've got it by department, you've got it by business unit, you've got it by project teams, 
you, you've, 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 got, you've got data out there. All you have to do is point to where things are. It's a scoreboard. And then people have the opportunity to either make the choice to say, I need some coaching, I need some help, I'm behind here, let's figure this out. Or at some point, I've seen people self-eject. It becomes so obvious that they are tired of being at the bottom of some, of some rank-ordered list that they realize that they're not cutting the mustard and it's time for them to go. So anyway, there are some, some answers, I hope, that, that are helpful to the uh, handful of questions that we uh, that we got uh, just now. Let's see if there are any others. Uh, as the C as the CEO, how often should you uh, reinforce clarity? I would say, as a communicator, you should keep uh, doing it until you're sick of saying it. Because about the time you're sick of saying it is about the time people are getting it. We need to be clear about our values. We need to be clear about how our performance is measuring up. We need to have a lot of cl- look. As, as, one, as one CEO that I work with said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. So we want to be able to shine a light on all of these things because then people have the choice to improve and, 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 and to get better, or they're making a choice that, you know what, this, this isn't for, for them. Uh, on a company that's growing with many challenges and many employees can be overwhelmed, how do you approach a new project? Like any other project, you've got to fit it into the priorities. You've got to see where it is. And you've got to have someone who is the champion of, of, that, of that project. I think you bring people together. That's what we do in, in planning sessions uh, that, that, that I lead. We talk about the priorities. We talk about who's going to be on point for this. Everyone who is on uh, uh, in a planning session, whether it's a, a project team or a business unit or a leadership team is there because they are going to be expected to do something. And, and so everybody's got to be expected to uh, have a role. So we've got one more minute and I'm going to uh, just, I'm going to leave you with this last thought. Let me, uh, let me just uh, wrap, wrap this up. Thanks for your questions. Here's the thought. If you want to invest in yourself, Uh, spend 20 bucks and get this book. This is really more about organizational performance and organizational accountability. As I said, I went looking for a a silver bullet. I didn't really find it. I found the seven pillars, character, unity, learning, tracking, urgency, reputation, evolving. The closest thing that I found to a silver bullet is clarity. And and what I would say to you on on this, and I'm going to stop the share and I'll just speak to you from from this. We're going to post all of this uh, this recording in a week. Uh, go to my website and download all the all the tools that are there. There, there that are two or three new ones uh, that I've uh, shared with you on this call. We're going to have the uh, the ebook on how you rejuvenate an underperformer. That's going to be out within 30 days. And um, in the in the meantime, thank you all for uh, for tuning in. It was a great privilege for me to be with you, and I wish you uh, great success. So long.